Dear friends of the Danish Institute in Athens, two years ago we could not meet. One year ago we could not meet. Today we do it, and we hope, I'm sure, all of us to look into a future looking almost like what we had two or three years ago. Well, we all do know this is not possible. But we have to do our contribution in the area of human research, of humanistic research, to do our best to bring forward the spirit of this proud country, Greece. On behalf of the board and the Danish Institute of Athens, and I'm the chairman, I'm afraid, I am very proud to bring forward our most sincere gratitude to all our participants, all our collaborators, and on the behalf of the board, I wish to thank the whole staff, Mons Pilt, the director, all of you, for keeping up the good spirit and a vivid atmosphere whenever someone tries to enter the houses in Athens. We are going to go through an interesting program, which I'm sure will be introduced by our director at the end of the whole announcement in the Acropolis Museum, and I'm very fond of the director, our colleague here, that we have been able to meet here again. At the end, we are going to invite you to a small reception at the Institute, which you can see on the picture over there. I'll pass on the word to Mons. Thank you very much, Pierre. And um, dear members of the board, of the Institute, distinguished guests, colleagues and friends, it is a great pleasure to be able to welcome you this evening to the annual meeting of the Danish Institute at Athens. I repeat that many to the Tegouf Simvulio to the Instituto Tisdanias, I repeat this in Adelphi, Phyllis Kefili, Kyrias Kekirie, in the Megali Mutimi, Nasas Kalasoriso, Apopse. I would also like to thank the director of the museum, the Acropolis Museum, Dr. Pater Melis, for hosting us uh, this evening. Uh, a few words on uh, the program this evening. Pierre lifted a wheel of some of the stuff which will take place. But uh, first, uh, I will report on the activities of the Institute here in Athens uh, in the year 2021. Uh, then we will have a musical intermezzo uh, by the conductor, composer, and pianist, uh, Bernhard Foss. And then uh, we will have the annual lecture. Uh, this year is by Dr. Silke Müns Frederiksen, who will give a lecture uh, entitled The Old Sikian Project, Seven uh, Years of uh, Results of Seven Years of Research. Archika, almost for Ifelana, Ephraistis of Ferma, to Ipurio, Politismo, Kerfitismo, Tisilavas. Keolitis archaeologies for years, but is opios ichame, Tindina totita, Masina Castume, Taterefte Achronia. Keto, Liu Hilia de Sicusiena, Itan a Sigura mea de Fortiki Chronia, Alla Pali, Os Instituto, Niosame, Tin Stirixi, et Uipurio, Ketone Ferion. Um, what I said is that I would like to send my warmest thanks to the Greek Ministry of Culture and Sports and to all the archaeological efforts and other institutions uh, that have uh, helped the Danish Institute uh, through these years. And uh, mm. with those, we have had the uh, opportunity to collaborate uh, through the same years. 2021, like 2020, has certainly uh, been different from all the other years. But uh, we did feel the support uh, during these years of the Greek institutions, and uh, we are happy that we can continue the fruitful cooperation with them. 
2021 actually began in the worst possible conditions. Greece was in a lockdown and traffic between Denmark and uh, Greece uh, was restricted to such a degree that they could neither send or receive visitors. Slowly, however, it began to ameliorate and from May last year and onwards, once again, we could welcome our first resident artists and scholars at Athens. It took a little while longer before we could uh, admit live audience to our cultural and scholarly events. But then that became possible. Once again, we could receive people who had come a long way from Denmark to engage oneself with the many realities which is Greece, and we could help to bring them in contact with those in Greece who had welcomed visitors from Denmark as colleagues and associates in cooperation. It does not change the fact, however, that we had to navigate um, in accordance with these constraints, and it meant fewer public events, fewer residents, but it also affected the ca uh, planned campaigns of the archaeological fieldworks. <laughs> uh, the activities of the Danish Institute at Athens can be divided into four categories. The residences, the cultural program, education and research. And over the past year, that is uh, 2021, we hosted 68 artists, teachers and orders and scholars and the residences are sponsored by the New Carlsberg Foundation and the TEC Geld Foundation, to whom we are very grateful. 2021 marked the bicentennial, bicentennial of the Greek Revolution. I don't think I need to tell you that it was an event that changed everything in the lands which became Greece. But it was also a European event of similar importance it challenged the order established by, on the continent by the Restoration in the wake of the, Nap of the Napoleonic Wars. It gave hope to those um, who wanted to see the ideals of constitutionalism and national freedom prevail. It mobilized public opinion. It saw volunteers from all around, around Europe uh, go to Greece to fight with the Greece. And it impacted the stance of the great powers to such a degree that three of them decided to initiate a series of actions which culminated in the naval battle of Navarino in 20, uh, 1827, a milestone in clearing the path for Greek um, independence. In that way, the Greek Revolution also affected Denmark. And this was the background against which we decided to launch a series of four lectures concerning Denmark and the Greek Revolution. The first two ones were digital, and the last two ones were uh, public events. Uh, the uh, lectures discussed the, officials react the official reactions by the Danish state, and on the picture here you see the Danish king at the period, for like a sixth. The Danish states, which for a long period, until Navarino, the Battle of Navarino, took a stance which followed uh, the stance of Metternich, the Austrian statesman, one of the main architects of the new European order after the Napoleonic Wars, who saw the Greek Revolution as dangerous. Uh, but the um, lectures also discussed the responses in the public sphere. Who were the Danes who went to Greece? And who were the Danes who took up the liberating aspects of the Greek Revolution. And finally, it took up a, a third a aspect, namely that the Greek Revolution also spurred an interest in Greece beyond the theater of war. And you see here one of those who actually got inspired in Greece in a, by Greece in a different way. Here is a drawing from Patras, which he made. Um, this also made it topical to take up other aspects of Greek-Danish relations. And the Institute did so already in 2019 as a co-organizer of a conference concerning the role of the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark in the very similar process which led Greece to leaving the Council of Europe 
during the military dictatorship. It was to some extent against that background that we decided in 2021 uh, to organize a book launch of Sevastir Khatsopoulos' book, The Europeanization of National Administrations, uh, Common Agricultural Policy in Denmark and Greece. And we had the opportunity to bring together two discussions, one from Denmark, Professor Rasmus Meyer from the University of Copenhagen, and our own postdoc and Karlsberg fellow, Christos uh, Takas. Uh, there are many more and other important aspects of Greek-Danish relations to address, and it is our aim to continue doing so in the future. A few years ago, 2019 again, Vikings was a theme and a subject of a, a joint conference between the Danish Institute and the other Scandinavian Institute, the Norwegian and the Swedish one. Uh, in 2021, we took up that line uh, in a series of lectures. And what you see here are three lectures, actually. And what you see here uh, is uh, the Danish contribution, Mass Honger's uh, lecture about Rangbow, that is rank fortresses, uh, titled The Large, the Largest Const uh, Construction Project of the Viking Age. Uh, we also held other book presentations, and uh, this is uh, concerning, in this case, Caria and the Dodecanese Cultural Interrelations in Southeast Aegean, a book uh, edited by Paul Peterson, Beatty Paulson, and John Lund. Regarding culture and music, uh, in this case music, uh, once again this year, that is 2021, uh, we supported the jazz festival at Technopolis here in Greece, and we supported the Danish jazz band, uh, Kuti Mango's virtual participation at the festival. So what we did, the band did, was to, to um, play live, but before a camera, and then it was uh, broadcast here on a big screen in Athens. We also had uh, a seminar, uh, a small <coughs> symposium, if you like, uh, concerning post-migration and reframing, reframing uh, identity, community, and history, uh, organized at a place called Space 52, which is a gallery here in Athens. And we had participants from Denmark, Anne Rank Petersen and Sabine Dale Nielsen, and from Greece, Sotiris uh, Bakhtigis. On the one day and on the second day, we had a screening of a film by Beratia Tomic uh, uh, calling Total, uh, called Photal uh, Europe. Uh, our digital efforts were noticed, and together with the Athens Digital Festival, the Danish Institute was awarded uh, the Busias Communication Gold Award for Best Pirate from Physical to Digital Public Event for the uh, arrangement of Kentaur. Uh, it was a, a screenplay. Uh, on a big screen here, uh, here in, uh, at the Institute, arranged in 2020 in, co in cooperation with uh, the Athens Digital Festival and Dance Theater. And the award was uh, handed over to Antonia Pilarinos, who's in the middle from the Danish uh, Institute. Regarding education, the main event of 2021 was Olkras Kursel by Gorm Thorsten, who once again managed to arrange a course in ancient Greek for Danish students who are and were eager to get closer to the world of ancient Greece. And the uh, course was supported by the GEC Foundation, uh, to which we are very grateful. We also received, uh, on a regular basis, gymnasium students, high school students, students from the Ligio uh, in Greek, uh, in collaboration with the Greek embassy. And we are very grateful to the ambassador and his staff for this important contribution to uh, the recruitment for future generation of Danish students uh, with a strong interest in Greek culture, modern as well as ancient. Um, we also had a major publication in 2021, 
and it was the much awaited publication by Bjorn Lovén, Dr. Bjorn Lovén, The Ancient Harbors of the Piraeus, and it is volume three, which you see here in two tomes. It was funded by the Casper Foundation, and the uh, two volumes focus primarily on the Zia Harbor projects, excavations for a Munachia, a naval base, which was one of the three major ports of ancient Athens in Piraeus. We also have a number of scholars um, attached to the Institute, and 2021 marked a year of intense writing and editing activities by all of them. Our Deputy Director, Kasper Tormod, who is also a Kasper Fellow, is combining the contemporary uh, aspects of Greece with ancient, with ancient past. Uh, the title of his project is Rethinking Athenian Past, the Present and Past Through Post-Crisis Art, 2009-19. to It examines how contemporary artists can contribute to a new understanding of the history of Athens by engaging with historical source material and narratives. And Casper examines how artists interact with the Greek capital on a visual level, how they create work that situates the city in the entanglement of past and present, and it brings a dialogue to the fore, and it empowers artistic practices with the potential to generate alternative visions that invite us to critically rethink the history of the city today. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the, the main uh, hypotheses of Casper's uh, work is that Athens, Athens brings forth the contrast between the idea of the city uh, as the cradle of European civilization and the brutal reality following the economic crisis of the past decade. It has created a situation that calls, uh, according to Casper, for a radical rethinking of connections between the Athenian past and present. And uh, during the past year, Casper has been focusing on the work of uh, Greek graffiti artists like uh, Barbadi, who you see here on the screen, as well as international artists who live and work in Athens. And he's working right now, Casper, on a series of articles that explore the intersection between contemporary art and historiography, artistic production, and knowledge production. The uh, brutal reality following the economic crisis of the past decade has also a bearing on our postdoc and Casper fellow, Christos Tsakas. Christos's project is entitled The Northern and Southern en Enlargement in Historical Perspective, Scandinavian and Greek Responses to European Integration in the 60s and 70s. Christos has been with us since July uh, 2019, this project explores the European integration dynamics from a business history perspective through a comparative analysis of the first and second enlargement of the European community with a focus on Greece, Denmark, Norway, and their relations to Germany or to West Germany when we are back in this period of history. Uh, Christus has been very productive in terms of output also. Uh, this year, or in 2021, he published Growth Models and Core Periphery Interaction in European Integration, published in the Journal of Common Market Studies. And uh, the article investigates the history of German-Greek relationship in the context of European integration, and it highlights the role West Germany and West, uh, West German and Greek business networks played in the shaping of Greece's post-war model. To some extent, his article was also the outcome of his short, because of the pandemic, research day at the Harvard Center for European Studies in early 2020. He also has a book manuscript and a contract with Palgrave Macmillan on a book entitled Post-War Greco German Relations economic development, business interest, and European integration. The book tells the fascinating story 
of how a country that suffered under Nazi occupation made an early turn to West Germany and how they later became or came to champion Greece's accession to the common uh, market in the 60s and later in the 80s. Our PhD student and Karlsberg fellow, Panayotis Athanasopoulos, comes from the Lekayan Harbor Project, which conducted field work from 19, uh, 2014 to 2018. In 2020, Panayotis Athanasopoulos assumed the position as a Karlsberg Fellow at the Danish Institute at Athens and initiated a publication project that will include the results of the first five years of excavations at the ancient harbor of Lycaon in Corinth, in Greece. Uh, the new publication is planned to result in two monographies published uh, at the Danish Institute and uh, the project is fully funded by the Karlsberg Foundation. The aim of his project is to study, the present, uh, to study and present the archaeological, historical and topographical transformation of the Lycaon Harbor area and give a better understanding of one of the largest and most important ancient harbors in the Mediterranean Sea. Additionally, uh, the methodology of the project has established an acknowledged school of best practice and the publication will provide an up-to-date manual on how ancient harbors should be documented. During 2021, as the pandemic, uh, as pandemic-related restrictions were gradually lifted, the pending laboratory work related to the analysis of the geological samples of the harbor area was resumed. And the same was true for the analysis and condition assessments of the timber used in the harbor structures. And also it was true for the study of the ceramic finds. In the same time, in the same year, uh, the subsequent systematic dissemination of uh, the work by Panos led to several invitations to communicate the results in academic and public lectures. And in 2021, the work of the project has been featuring in no less than 12 occasions in conferences, articles, and media, and uh, more have already been planned for, for 2022. I will resume my talk very soon, but you can enjoy the picture, the live picture from the Likaya Harbor area, where the, where the research was conducted and which provide the basis for the publication of, of panels. Uh, I now turn to the report by Dr. Sine Barfud, who is a postdoc at the Oslo University. Her project, Rediscovering Artemis, concerns the study and publication of the pottery and small finds from the 1920s and 30s excavations of the Artemis uh, Lafria sanctuary in Caridon in, uh, uh, in Etolia. The project is primarily sponsored by the Casper Foundation but has also received support from the Norwegian Institute in Athens, engineer Sven Fiedler's and Wife scholarship uh, in order to promote botanical and archeological uh, research. Uh, and also she has received money from Elisabeth Mungsgaard's foundation. Despite the pandemic, the work with the publication of the pottery from the sanctuary has progressed significantly actually in 2021. 
And in total, 1,202 pottery entries, both fragmented and complete vessels, have been catalogued and classified based on chronology and provenance, as can be seen on the table on the left-hand side of the slide. The uh, conservation of the pottery keeps revealing, according to report, new and fascinating evidence. And one example is this piece, which is an attic red figure fragment which preserved the pinti of Sigma and possible Kappa. And the animal might be a bovine, and the scene might ten ten uh, ten uh, tentatively be interpreted as a visual possession. Um, furthermore, one of the outcomes of this uh, research uh, has been the novel idea that miniature pottery uh, was not only on functional vessels, but could in some cases have served as containers for dedication of small consumables, such as different grains associated with the dedication of first fruit offerings, for instance, during the agricultural festival. And the idea was presented, this idea I just mentioned, at a virtual conference at the Austrian Archaeological Institute in 2020, and it will be published in the proceeding of the conference of the same uh, institute, uh, which is now in press at the Austrian Academy of Science. Uh, the manuscript of the first volume will include the pottery and terracotta lamps from the old excavation, and it is expected to be completed in 2022 uh, and will subsequently um, be published in the monography series at the Danish Institute. And um, they are very grateful, Sine is very grateful to all her benevolent supporters uh, from the efferets from the foundations and for the various institutes around here, which you can see on this slide. We will now turn to the report uh, on the project entitled Reinvestigating Caledon's Lavrion Hill. In 2021, the institute began a new archaeological project in uh, ancient Caledon in Etolia. And um, the project is carried out in collaboration with Everett of Antiquities in Eto Lo Akranamia and Lefkada. And it is directed by the effort Dr. Olympia Vitaku and Associate Professor Søren Hanberg, uh, prof uh, Associate Professor of Classical Archaeology of the University of Oslo. The project, which is uh, generously funded by the Augustinus Foundation, is a reinvestigation of the sanctuary of Artemis Lavria just outside the city's western gate that was uh, partially excavated by Frederick, Paul Frederick Paulsen and Constantinos Romeos in the 1920s and 1930s. The overall aim of the project is to re rewrite the historical and cultural development of the sanctuary and to investigate its uh, social importance uh, from a local and regional perspective. Uh, work will include geophysical and detailed topographical work, excavation of previously unexplored areas of the sanctuary and soil deposits from the old excavations, as well as targeted archaeoscientific investigations. Due to the pandemic situation, it was not possible to carry out, or it was possible only to carry out limited geophysical work at the site. And these works took place in October 2021 in preparation for work this year in 2022. Non destructive, non invasive magnetic uh, prospection was carried out in the area of approximately 2,000 square meters immediately to the east of the Hellenistic Stoa, which you can see on this slide here. The sacred road between the city's west gate and the sanctuary is presumed to run through this area. And since no excavations have ever been carried out in that area, uh, the aim of the project is to identify traces of the road 
and any unidentified monuments along its course. But unfortunately, no unequivocal traces of larger store monuments were identified within the surveyed area. However, magnetic readings showed only minor differences in the magnetic uh, uh, properties of the sandstone used in the monuments and the surrounding soil, something which means that the foundations laying at deeper depths cannot be identified through uh, cannot be identified through a geomagnetic survey. But even so, several aligned rows of rounded anomal uh, anomal uh, anomalies placed approximately 1.4 meters apart were identified. At, and some of these rows can be traced for a length of more than 40 meters. The chronology of these anomalies remain unknown, but they might represent post holes from wooden structures and constructions, possibly buildings or wooden posts for tropea, that is victory trophies, as has, for instance, been, suge been suggested for the post holes in the stadium in the ancient Olympia. This year, the project, this year in 2022, the project plans to begin the excavations within the surveyed area and mm. uh, hope to be able to clarify the nature of these intriguing magnetic uh, anomalies. The project like to thank all its collaborators, institutions, and individuals whose help has been essential for establishing and carrying out the project. And in particular, we are grateful to the August Stevens Foundation for generously providing financial support, and not least to the Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Sports for granting permission to undertake uh, this project. We now turn to the report by Troels Myrup Christensen, Associate Professor of Classical Art and Archaeology in the School of Culture and Society at Aarhus University. In uh, 2020, a new project to re-examine the sculptural finds from the Heron of Calidon was initiated with generous funding from the Carlsberg Foundation. And this project, Gods, Heroes and Pixels, Re-examining the sculptures from the Heron of Calidon restudies the important assemblage of Hellenistic sculpture and the Heron itself that was excavated by Frederik Paulsen, who was a director in the 1930s, 20s and 30s of the new Carlsberg Lithotech, and his Greek colleague Konstantinos Romeos. The new project will apply modern methods of archaeological documentation and non-destructive destructive visual analysis of the Heron sculptures over time. Uh, and it will complete a systematic reanalysis uh, and full publication of the assemblage and complex in which it was found. <coughs> Pilot work <coughs> by the project in October 2020 focused on nine sculptures from the Huron that are currently at display uh, on the Agrinio Archaeological Museum. And preliminary <coughs> results suggest that even though the sculptures have been presented as, homo as a homogeneous group of Tonto bust, they have a complex history of display and collecting. The project <coughs> suggests that the renewal made by the same workshop nor produced for the Heron. During <clears throat> further work in 2021 and with the kind help of the Everett and museum staff, the project unearthed a significant number of sculptures in the storage at the Agrinia Museum that has never been probably published and that can now be fully studied. And it is the aim of this project to return to the field this summer, that is in 2022. We now to turn to the report by Dr. Silkemens Frederiksen uh, concerning the Sikion uh, project, Finding Old Sikion. It's a collaboration project on the archaic classical polis of Sikion in the northeastern Peloponnese 
It is directed by Dr. Konstantinos Kisas from the Ministry of Culture uh, in Greece and Dr. Silke Münz Frederiksen from the National Museum of Denmark. Funding is provided by the Casper Foundation with contribution from the Jöster Engblom Foundation. And the main focus of the project is the urban fabric and material culture of the pre-Hellenistic city. And field studies were terminated in 2019. It means that in 2021, the main focus was directed on the preparation of the main publications uh, and the new archaeological depot, which you can see here uh, on this slide. And the building was finally finished, uh, provided with, with interior e equipment and proudly taken into use in uh, July, in fact, actually on the 1st of July, 2020. Uh, one. We have another slide with pictures from the place. And um, the um, publication of a project's results is going to happen in two major vol volumes. One uh, is on the surveys from 2015 to 16, and the other one. Uh, concerns uh, the excavations uh, 2017 to 19. Uh, the um, preparation of the excavation publication um, involved a long season of study which was organized in Sikion and it was running from the end of May uh, until the beginning of December 2021 with an ever-changing group of participants. Uh, two articles on uh, archaeobotanical and geophysical studies within the project were published in 2021, and two more articles, including a preliminary report on the field season of uh, 19, uh, 2018 and 19, uh, were published uh, in the proceedings uh, of the Danish Institute at Athens, which we, sorry. Um, we also have, or the project has also produced uh, a, a MA thesis on skeletons and burial customs in southeastern, on this, in the southeastern necropolis of Sikion. And it was submitted by Mette Lang to Aarhus University in June 2000, uh, 2021. And it also produced another MA thesis on uh, burial monuments in the Peloponnese, including the grave monument from Trans 7C in Old Sikion by Gabriela Bulakaki, who is still ongoing with a project at the University of Crete. It also produced M uh, PhD thesis, uh, and all of them were written within the framework of the project. Nadja Maria Christensen has defended her thesis already, entitled The Abandonment and Relocation of Old Sikion in 303 BCE, an analysis of formation processes and ceramics at the University of Copenhagen. It was submitted at the University of Copenhagen in November 2021. And Katharina Rauch has defended her thesis, Geopolitical uh, Prospection of Archaeological Sites on the Northern Peloponnese in Greece at the University of Kiel in January 2022. And uh, Kiriaki uh, 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 Tsirtsi has submitted her PhD thesis on agricultural and domestic practices in classical section, evidence from the archaeobotanical remains and utilitarian pots to the Cyprus Institute in March 2022. We will now turn to the report by Lasse Sørensen, which concerns the investigation of a Jedi outcrops from the Aegean prehistory uh, at the campus on Syros, the island of Syros. Uh, it is a project financed by General Consul Jöster Engblom's Foundation 
and the institution in, in, institutions involved in the project is the Danish Institute at Athens, the uh, Everett of the Cyclades, Cyclades, the National Museum of Denmark, and the Geological Department at the University of uh, Athens. And the uh, managing participants in the project is Dr. Lasse Sørensen from the National Museum, Professor Søren Ditz, uh, Dr. Dora Papagenlopulo, and, and, and Dr. Konstantinos Mavrogonatos. The aim of this project is to gain new knowledge about the procurement, production, and exchange of jadeite axes, and to investigate the establishment of networks in the Aegean prehistory, focusing on the outcrop on Syros. The research background of the project is that jadeite axes are seen as objects of power and symbols of identity and transmitters of ideas. And the uh, geological survey on Syros reveals that jadeite boulders are not only found on the northern part of the island and in the, and, and in particular within the Campos and neighboring valleys. The jadeite formation goes from the Campos Valley and all the way to Gritzas, uh, Gritzas Valley in the east. And it was possible for the, for the project to sample geological rock from the whole formation in order to make accurate provenance determinations of the jadeite raw material via laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry which can later be compared with analysis of jadeite axes and axes from the Aegean. The results of this is that in connection with the collection of geological samples of jadeite at Campus in 2021, uh, which took place uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Konstantinos Mavrogonatos from the University of Athens, the project inspected the geological jadeite outcrops on campus. And during the investigation, it quickly became clear that near and around the jadeite boulders, there were observed several surface finds of jadeite flakes and preforms together. They preformed together with prehistoric pottery and marine shell, uh, a sample which documents that jadeite was exploited during the prehistoric uh, period in the Aegean. The investigation resulted in the identification of 10 quarrying sites. And these are all located next to larger jadeite boulders, where finds of jadeite flake has been observed, especially near the largest locality of uh, number one, the site number one. But there are other quarrying sites in the neighboring valleys. And it has thus been possible to expand the survey also to other areas. The project aimed to continue in 2022, and they are most grateful uh, to a number of their supporters, to the Jöster Engbom Foundation, to the uh, Everett of the Cyclists, to the National Institute of Copenhagen, to the University of Athens, uh, and also to the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland to the Danish Institute of Athens that is here, and the Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Sport. I'm about to finish my report, but I would like to extend my thanks to uh, people you haven't met yet, you have seen them, you may not know their names, namely to my staff, to Antonia uh, Pilarinos, to Kasper Tormod, who have, whom you have heard about, to Kirsten Sørensen, to Nika, uh, Niki Buras, to Joanna Fanasi and Maxi Fanasi and Anna uh, Triantu. This was the end of my report, but we haven't finished yet. We have a musical intermezzo by the Vienna-based Danish-German conductor, composer, and pianist Bernhard Melby Voss, who made his uh, conducting debut with the Austrian Radio Symphony Orchestra in 2018. Uh, Bernhard, you are here, I hope. Is it so? Yes. I'm not finished, but I just wanted to be sure because I wanted to say that you have a passion for film music and uh, you actually started to, to work on a session 
or as a session conductor for film music uh, in, um, very recently. You also have a professional, a profound interest in languages and the relation between languages and music and uh, in the linguistic features of music. Uh, and you have worked extensively, and you are on your way down here, with um, opera. So Bernhard, uh, the piano is yours. Thank you very much. So uh, just to short introduce the program, I uh, had planned to play a Danish program, but since I suffered um, an infection in my wrist a few months ago, I've uh, been uh, struggling with pain in, uh, in my wrist. So I just um, had to take a standard repertoire or something, um, uh, heightened sonata. For
Thank you very much, Bernhard, uh, for your performance. And now we are approaching the last part of the session here at the Acropolis Museum. And Silke, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Moments. I would like to express my warmest thanks to you and to the board of the Danish Institute for inviting me to giving this uh, talk mm -hmm. here, as well as uh, to the former director of the Danish Institute, Christina Winter Jakobsen, who already invited me in 2020 to give this talk. It couldn't happen, you know all why. It couldn't. I was invited again in 21, and it couldn't happen. <laughs> So I think I am the only one to have been invited three times in a row to give this talk. I'm very much honored. <laughs> Ancient Sikian was a polis on the northeastern Peloponnesian coast between the polis of Corinth to the southeast and Pelene to the northwest. Before I go into media series and describe the research of uh, our project on old Sikian, I will start with a little introduction on the history of the polis and why it was important as a political factor and as a center of arts. The old city of Sikyon seems to go back to, uh, at least to the Mycenaean age. Oh, sorry, that's where Sikyon is located. Now you can see it here. <laughs> so, the old city of Sikyon seems to go back at least to the Mycenaean age, when the settlement apparently was called Agia Leia, and Sikyon is also mentioned in Homer's ship catalog. About Sikyon's history in the Dark Ages, there is no direct information. 
But at the beginning of the archaic period, Sikion was obviously dominated by Argos. The situation was to change with the rise of the dynasty of tyrants called the Orthagorids, who ruled Sikion from around the middle of the 7th until the middle of the 6th century BC. The best known member of this dynasty was Cleisthenes, the grandfather of the later Athenian reformer of the same name. He reigned for uh, roughly 20 years in the early 6th century, achieved Sikion's independence from Argos, and founded the Pythian Games in Sikion in honor of Apollo, only to name a few of his good deeds. The Orthagorid uh, tyranny was overthrown around uh, 550 BC by Sparta and replaced by an oligarchy, and Sikion remained an ally of Sparta thereafter. In the 5th century BC, Sikion contributed fairly to the Greek forces in the Persian Wars and fought on the side of Sparta in the Peloponnesian War. But from 369 BC onwards, Sikion was uh, allied with Thebes and later in the 360s, it was again subject to a tyranny for a few years under Euphron. After the time of Alexander the Great, Sikion was dominated by changing kings or generals during the wars of the Diadochi, and from 308 onwards, it was in the hands of Ptolemy. In 303 BC, however, the Macedonian king Demetrius Polyakatis attacked and captured Sikion by a stratagem. Written sources relate that he was pretending to hold a big feast for several days in Corinth in order to lull Ptolemy into a false sense of security and then attacked Sikion by surprise on several places at the same time, so it was easy for him to capture it. Demetrius rebuilt the city on a better defendable site above the old place, which he called Demetrius after himself. He destroyed the old town and moved all the inhabitants to the new place. So uh, it is recorded. However, people soon stopped calling the new city Demetrius and went back to the much more fam familiar name of Sikion. Already in the archaic period, Sikion developed into a center of arts that attracted artists from other regions who came to live there, mainly painters and sculptors, but also the famous poet Ibikos from Region in southern Italy seems to have lived there for a while. In the later archaic period, the Sikionian sculptors Kanachos and Aristocles gained fame, while the first known painters of Sikion were Telephanes and Crater. In the classical period, Polycletus might have been born in Sikion before he moved to Argos. That's not sure. But in Argos, he had a school with many Sikionian members. Here you can see his story Phoros and the Diadumenos, that is the spare bearer and the diadem binder. The just as famous Lysippos uh, was definitely a Sikionian. He worked there for most of his professional life in the 4th century BC and established a thriving school of sculptors with illustrious names coming from it. According to Pliny the Elder, Lysippos created 1,500 works of art in the roughly 60 years of his activity. For example, the Apoxiomenos um, or Scraper and the Heraclos Farnese, which you can see here on the slide. The Sikionian sculptor Eutychides was a pupil of Lysippos. He created the personification of the city of Antiochia, called Tyche, around 300 BC. Of the classical paint painters, Eupompos is best known. He founded a Sikion painting school in the 4th century, which was attended by the great painter Apelles. Also, the famous Pausias was a pupil of Eupompos, and, for example, known for his floral garlands and flower paintings, which might have inspired mosaics found in Sikion, like a very famous one at the Museum of Sikion. At the time that the city was relocated, it was in possession of such a great number of artworks that Demetrius, uh, Demetrius Mistress, the famous courtesan Lamia, built an art gallery in the new city, the first of its kind known in history. This new Hellenistic uh, town has been identified already around 150 years ago on a plateau over a large maritime plain around four kilometers away from the coastline. The site has been explored by American and Greek archaeologists and excavated to quite some degree. In recent years, Janis Lollas has done excellent survey and excavation work there. The old city, however, had totally disappeared and its location had been forgotten. Written sources uh, led to the theory that it must have been situated in the maritime plain below the plateau. 
between the rivers of Halison, Asopos, and the sea. While other scholars thought it was located farther away or didn't consist of a coherent settlement at all. Rescue excavations of the effort of antiquities of Corinth and archaeological surveys by Yanis Lollas, however, found various indi indications in the plain and on the plateau. On the southeastern spur of the plateau, which is just down here, finds go back to the, the Neolithic period and point to a small settlement there, which grew more important in the Bronze Age, probably corresponding with the Aegea mentioned before. This is confirmed by Mycenaean graves next to the village of Mulki in the plain here, and a large Mycenaean necropolis with 30 chamber tombs close to the village of Palihori, which is located there. Discovered during the construction of the new railway Athens Kyato since 2002. Furthermore, geometric to classical graves as well as various classical house remains were found at several places in the plain. So here you can see a, a row of uh, grave places and houses were found in this area here, for example, and other areas as well. This whole situation was actually screaming for being further investigated, and this was the incentive of starting our project on Old Sikia. It started in 2015 as a collaboration of the National Museum of Denmark, the Effort of Antiquities in Corinth, the Danish Institute at Athens, and the Institute for Geosciences at the University of Kiel in Germany, and is generously founded by the Carlsberg Foundation with supplementary grants by the Gösta Inbom Foundation. In the 2015, the project was started by Rune Frederiksen before I overtook from him in 2016. The main aims of the project were to identify the precise location of archaic uh, classical Sikion and its harbor, to investigate its material culture, and to verify if life in the old town really has come to an end in 303 BC. Moreover, we hope to offer a good case study for the development of archaic and classical urbanism, because the area was never substantially overbuilt, apart from a few minor hamlets. In our first uh, two years of research, we applied mostly non-invasive methods in order to localize the city. A side-by-side -side survey di directed by Christina Winter Jakobsen and large-scale geophysical investigations carried out by the Institute of Geosciences of Kiel University and the company Eastern Atlas from Berlin. Geoarchaeological investigations, including auguring and resistivity measurements, were conducted by Wieke Denis from Groningen University and Burkhard Ulrich from Eastern Atlas, while remote sensing was done by Jamie Donati from the Institute um, of Mediterranean Studies on Crete. The second investigation phase of the project included large-scale large excavations from 2017 to 2019, some last geophysical investigations and a geoarchaeological survey by Chris Hayward from Edinburgh University directed towards the identification of stone materials and the search for quarries. As for the results, let us start with our geoarchaeological survey. 47 cores were done by manual auguring and 15 geoelectric prof profiles accompanied these cores. From these cores and profiles, a landscape section model was created, which uh, shows alluvial and colluvial deposits, as well as the effects of slope wash. Furthermore, the depth and character of the archaeological strata could be determined, who were concentrated in the vicinity of the plateau here, where there the cores were void of any archaeological material, largely void, and here only a few um, archaeological materials without clear stratigraphy were found. In the archaeological survey, three different methods were employed. A fully quantitative intensive survey with total collection at 10 meters intervals. On fields with poor visibility, the same method but including raking. And in areas of special interest, a qualitative survey collecting diagnostic shirts over the entire surface. Significant finds outside the transect lines, such as diagnostic shirts, architectural structures or elements, were recorded as places of special interests, short posies. The survey area included most parts of the plain, not covered by modern settlement, which makes a total of approximately 8 square kilometers, of which roughly 10% were surveyed. 
The overall distribution pattern shows that the highest densities are found in the southwest corner of the plain, right here. From here, densities drop consistently towards the north and northeast, and even more towards the edges of the area. The finds date from the Bronze Age to present day, but the classical period is clearly predominant. And the slopes immediately east of the plateau, this area here, also yielded the best preserved fragments. The geophysical investigations included geomagnetic survey, electrical resistivity tomography, ground penetrating radar, and active and passive seismic measurements. The geomagnetic investigations in the southwestern part of the plain showed a clear difference between a zone densely packed with black and white contrast southeast of the plateau, that's this zone here, an intermediate area to the north and east from here where it gets a little bit less dense, that's around here, and calm areas on the margins of this zone, that's essentially here and here and down there. This offers us clear indications for the core of the old city in the southwest and a larger activity zone to the north, northeast and east. Furthermore, there is some evidence for the inner structure of the settlement in the form of potential streets. Our uh, other linear anomalies may point to the causes of fortification lines or ancient channels or streets. So the streets are marked in red here and other linear anomalies that we can't for the most part properly identify are marked in yellow. If we draw the approximate limit of the activity area here in light green, we arrive at a size of around 167 hectares, which includes not only densely settled quarters, but also loosely occupied areas. As you can see, the results of the geomagnetic research match uh, those of the survey perfectly, of the archaeological survey perfectly. The picture of the overall settlement from the different research methods shows some calmer spaces between areas of denser occupation, so Sikian's settlement pattern might perhaps have been a bit loose concern, um, consisting of different nodes, as it is also suspected for, for example, uh, Akai Corinth. Nevertheless, we are clearly dealing with a coherent settlement, which is also suggested by the written sources mentioning one fortification around it, by the way. Around the settlement, we found indications of an extended necropolis to the northwest, that's here, um, and potential traces of iron processing and um, maybe industrial quarter here in the southwest. The street network might look like a roughly rectangular pattern throughout the whole city, but we need to be very careful with this. Firstly, there are many deviations from a rectangular pattern. Secondly, some of the geophysical indications might show something else than streets. And finally, we uh, should not expect a regular street network throughout in a co continuously grown city like Sikia. One of the streets, that's actually this one here, um, seems to have run through to the ancient harbor of the city along um, the nearly straight track of a road still used today. The ancient harbor here uh, is to be expected around 100 meters inland from the modern coastline because of the continuous uplift, uplift of the Corinthian Gulf um, in its northern coast. The seismic measurements and the augerings indicate a former marine inlet of around 25 to 30 meters width in this, uh, this area. You can see this inlet down here and the seismic uh, results, which most probably was related to the ancient harbor. This area here has been suspected to be the location of the harbor uh, for a long time because of an artificial hill and a huge late antique basilica. So here is the basilica and there is the hill, which evoke parallels to the neighboring harbor of Flekayan. I will come back to other geophysical results when discussing our excavations. Remote sensing focused on um, the southwestern so zone of the plain in particular, based on a higher resolution satellite image from 2014, as well as four aerial photographs from 1945 to 87, on which several future, uh, feature enhancement indices were used. 
A large number of surface anomalies probably relate to paleo channels, while very few anomalies appear to be caused by other features, which is probably due to the dense density of trees and orchards in the plain. We always struggled with these trees and uh, orchards uh, also in the geophysics. And the larger area of the Sikionia plain, the most exciting discovery close to the coastline were two round anomalies of a diameter of 7 meters and in a distance of 12 meters. You can see them uh, maybe a little bit here, but uh, here I have encircled them and there they are very clear here. Um, these would actually be ideal dimensions, dimensions for a gate that would be leading into the harbor town, which was fortified by itself. As there were no architectural members or any other traces uh, of ancient occupation on the surface of this field whatsoever, we did not start any excavations there after all. So it simply remains a very nice theory for the moment. After these first two years of non-invasive research, we had already achieved a whole lot. We had actually found, uh, located the old city of Sikian and found out quite some details about its size and organization. And we had found out a mass of exciting places and anomalies to investigate by excavation. All in all, we opened 15 trenches on nine different fields distributed over the activity area of old Sikian. We are taking them from the city center towards the outskirts, starting with field one in the supposed core of the old town. Down here, the core, and there, field one. Here, resistivity measurements revealed two parallel lines of high resistivity, 14, uh, 40, 40 meters long and in a distance of roughly 20 meters. You can see these lines best in this picture here. That's different depth slices, and here it's most prominent. These could have been interpreted as two walls, two um, uh, collapsed walls, uh, as they are very irregular, and a zone of middle resistivity in between these walls could have represented a floor. All this looked very much like a monumental building, and so we started a trial trench, trench 1A. This showed after quite a short while that the huge resistivity lines were connected to natural bedrock. I have to admit that our colleagues from Kiel had pointed that possibility out to me well enough, but of course one always wishes to believe in the more spectacular solutions. And I have to compliment the geophysicists furthermore on the fact that the bedrock appeared precisely in the depth they had announced. So, all the same, this trench held a nice surprise for us. Below some minor remains of classical building activities, we found a late geometric to early archaic grave in a depression of the bedrock. Field two is located uh, to the northwest of field one. Here, two anomalies discovered in aerial photograph of 2015 were the reasons for uh, two trial trenches. As we could only excavate on the low, lower terrace of the field that is here, we could just not hit the large anomaly here in trench 2A, but we got close to it. Uh, in two, trench 2B, we could hit uh, one side of the smaller anomaly. But instead of uh, yeah, hitting the large anomaly, we unearthed two Ottoman walls here. And beneath, it was not everything we found beneath the Ottoman walls. We um, found part of an L-shaped um, floor from the first half of the 5th century, eventually, with uh, randomly placed multicolored pebbles in mortar framed by a higher edge. This floor could have belonged to a workshop, or, uh, which is more likely to an andron, that is a symposium room in a private building, which would be supported by the high amount of Corinthian and Attic black figured symposium were found around this floor. In trench 2b, it was a little bit more frustrating, there was part of, of another late wall that appeared which could account for the smaller anomaly and below it again a truck. So field 9 is located northeast of field 2, still in the core of the ancient town and seemed interesting because of a very high find density in the survey. Mosaic floor fragments found in an earlier rescue excavation and several geomagnetic anomalies suggesting ancient buildings. In trench 9A above, 
We found remains of two phases of a large domestic building from the late classical period, consisting of a mortar floor, which was in the second phase disrupted by several walls and replaced by a stamped earth floor. In French B, that's the one down here, we first discovered several classical channels. That's these channels here. And a late classical or early hedalistic room. That's the one up here. It seems a little bit too light um, here in the um, picture. Uh, with a mortared pebble floor and stockoed walls. So quite res representative um, residential building. In deeper layers, a deposit of miniature vessels of the 5th century BC here was arranged around a boulder. And even deeper, we finally found close to the end of our very last season, what we had, had hoped for a long time to find, four archaic walls probably connected to a floor. So that's one, two, three, and four. That's the archaic walls. Although we cannot be sure of their function, there are, these are the first architectural remains from the archaic period ever discovered in the plain of Sikia. And they suggest that the archaic city was located uh, here beneath the core of the classical settlement, as we had suspected it to be. Field 3 is located in a region bordering the core area to the north here. Resistivity measurements showed a large and a smaller rectangular structure. Here the larger, here the smaller. In this field, while the numerous uh, Parallel, yeah, there you can see the oops, two structures also a little bit deeper, while the numerous parallel anomalies um, that also can be seen deeper down uh, are obviously related to the tree grid on the field and to irrigation, so we just forget about that. We opened two trenches on this field, trench 3A over the smaller rectangular anomaly here in the southwest, and 3B over the southern side of the large anomaly uh, in the northeast. Trench A was excavated during three excavation seasons and extended several times. The building we found corresponds perfectly with the geophysical results and is quite intriguing in several respects. The earliest elements in the trench are three archaic graves, each with four to six burial burials of men, women, and in one course also an infant. Only the western grave contained offerings, among uh, which a ribolloi and a vase in the form of a hare, which date to the mid middle or late Corinthian period, which is in the late seventh, from the late seventh to the first half of the sixth century BC. In the first quarter of the fifth century, another grave with a monolithic sarcophagus was installed south of the other graves, which contained the skeleton of a tall man, accompanied by two iron sandal frames. That is quite uh, an interesting um, piece of um, yeah, um, grave gift we have found there. Uh, but comparable sandal frames are known from the Argolos in the same period. Also in the 5th century, two partly subterranean walls consisting of large orthostats. No, sorry, we are still here. <laughs> consisting of large orthostats, that's these two walls here were erected on the edges of the east and northern archaic graves. You can see they are right placed here on the edges of the graves, without their precise functions being known. Probably in the late 5th uh, or early 4th century, these walls were incorporated in a room of 6.3 to 4.4 meters, constructed of heterogeneous, heterogeneous rubble masonry around the archaic graves. So that's this room here. That's precisely constructed around the graves. In the northwestern corner, and perhaps also in the southeastern, so here and here, staircases, at least this is a staircase here, uh, led down uh, and provided access to this room. The superstructure most probably <laughs> consisted of mud bricks and a Laconian roof on top. Roof tiles and pottery were lying directly on the bedrock when we found them, and there were no traces of any floor above the graves which means that there always was immediate access to these graves. These are quite strong indications for a grave cult, probably an ancestor's cult, having taken place here. Although the room did not yield a typical find assemblage for a cult building. The find assemblage would rather hint to extensive dining and drinking activities, perhaps in a public or ritual context, because we found, found really lots of um, 
fine wear and um, cooking wear and um, coarse wear in this trench. This type of building is quite singular and must in some way have combined cultic and dining functions, but it is clearly placed outside the domestic sphere. The room went out of use in the middle of the third quarter of the 4th century BC, and after the end of the 4th century, when Sikion was relocated on the plateau, the remains of the room were covered with a massive fill of pebbles, sand and pot pottery fragments, either for leveling the area or, which is a bit more likely for sealing the building off because this pebble fill is quite exactly uh, over this building and not much uh, further around. Um, and this sealing off the building would be a further hint to its former cultic function. Trench 3B yielded part of a wall in a northwest southeast direction from the late 4th century BC or even earlier, that's this direction which actually, actually coincides with an inner cross wall of the large rectangular building in the resistivity picture, and another potential wall with partly reused blocks, that's this here, there's another block here, and this bit there, uh, corresponds with the southern side of the rectangular anomaly itself. So this is quite uh, what we have seen in the geophysical picture. But as we concentrated on trench A in this field, which was quite uh, interesting, we could not further investigate these walls. Field 4 is located in an eastern suburban area. So now we go from the core uh, of the settlement in the northern area to the eastern area. In the geomagnetics, a positive linear anomaly with a bulge in its middle. Here, there's the bulge. Um, and negative anomalies at its edges, so above and uh, beneath this anomaly here, uh, is most prominently running through several fields. In the results of the resistivity measurements, the same anomalies are recognizable. So here is the anomaly with the bulge here. Um, there are the negative anomalies, one here and one, oh, no, there. There we are but in addition also confusing network of many other lines. We placed two trenches on this field, trench A, well, trench A here and trench B here where the bulge runs. In trench 4A we excavated a roughly four meters wide late classical early Hellenistic road bordered by a wall on its northern edge and at its southern edge a channel later filled up and transformed into a wall. South of this channel, we uncovered three graves from the late 4th and the 3rd centuries BC. Trench 4b yielded two perhaps late classical walls diverging towards the east. And so here are these walls. Um, they have different masonry forms and uh, are lying on different levels and therefore uh, they are rather not uh, belonging to the same building. And south of these walls, so in this area here, um, compact layers here with uh, manifold repairs most probably represent road surfaces overlaying each other. In the southwestern corner of the trench, that is this corner here and here is the uh, focus, um, the corner of a late classical building of partly rough, partly worked, probably reused large blocks was built directly on the bedrock, the joints lavishly filled with plaster. Its function cannot be determined, but as we are in the area of a necropolis, it might, for instance, have belonged to the wall of a grave precinct. The excavations in uh, field 4 reveal that the linear positive geomagnetic anomaly represents a road running straight through Field 4, with its uh, strange bulge perhaps forming a kind of a side branch of this main street. It is quite obvious that we are dealing here with a border area of Old Sikian with a road uh, leading out of the city in the direction of its harbor, and graves accumulated in its vicinity. Let us now uh, shed a very short glance on Field 5, a bit more to the northwest. There. We placed a trench here because the whole field forms a long mound in otherwise uh, totally flat surroundings. So this field here is kind of mound while everything around is flat, which most probably indicates that this uh, mold was man-made. 
The trench yielded very interesting finds, that is coins, obsidian and flint fragments, for example, pottery from late geometric to middle Hellenistic times, and fragments of mortar, stucco and mosaic floors, which witness of buildings, although no part of an actual architectural structure was found. The finds from this trench show all the same that this area was occupied also after the removal of the town to the plateau. Because, um, uh, yeah, we have all these building remains in the trench and uh, it, the plain was uh, probably occupied here by single houses or farmsteads, which represents a precious piece of information. Field 8 is close to um, field 4 to the northwest, to field 5 to the northwest. And here we discover the corner of a quite monumental classical building constructed of large orthostats. That's this corner here. And southeast of it remains of several workshop floors. That's in this little um, hole there, which might be connected to the building in their function. I would love to interpret this as Lysippos' workshop, but alas, we didn't find any inscription. Uh, inscription saying so, so. <laughs> yeah, let's leave it. In the second half of the third century BC, a children's, uh, child's grave was installed in the um, corner of the monumental building. Uh, here, there you can see the grave, um, and marked the end of its former function, in the former function of this building. A second phase of activity in the trench dates to the late Roman or early Byzantine period, when a production space was defined by two walls uh, built against the corner of the older building. And a huge pithos was installed in this place. There you can see it's still in place. It's really a very huge uh, vessel. Olive stones inside the pithos suggest that the area might have been connected to olive oil production. At the northern edge of the town, Field 7 is located, which offered us a variety of geophysical anomalies. The geomagnetic results showed a possible crossroads in the northern part, that's here, and a broad magnetic minimum here, uh, crossing the field in its uh, southern half. The large scale resistivity measurements conducted in this field yield dense building structures parallel to the assumed crossroads in the north, that is here, and here you can even see a house uh, the wall with the door here um, and in the middle uh, of the western part of the field you can see a very large complex of around 18 to 20 meters and south of it a uh, low resistive anomaly where we also had the uh, um, low magnetic anomaly and then another pattern of structures in the southern part of the field in a different orientation than the northern part. We placed three trenches on this field in order to investigate the large complex um, in the west, the linear anomaly crossing the field and the southern pattern of stru structures. Trench A yielded a late classical residential structure, a square room with a door in its southern wall connecting it to a narrow storeroom where many storage vessels were found in a, a destruction layer. The destruction of the building, uh, the whole building, could be connected to the um, assault by Demetrius Polyarchetus or the, um, uh, afterwards the destruction of the town, because it's around this time, the end of the fourth, uh, beginning of the third century BC. Trench B over the linear anomaly did not yield any specific structures, only in great depth, uh, a close succession of layers of silty sand and gravel which could point to a former stream bed. So this would explain the linear anomaly. Trench C, finally placed over one of the southern structures, offered us quite a surprise. A grave monument from late classical early Hellenistic times. It features a linear architectural front. Here you can see it. It's toyka bait decorated with a kuma reversa. Behind it we found several grave cots, but only two graves from the late 4th or early 3rd century BC. Whoop, no. Here you can see all the grave cots that we examined, but only two graves actually were in these cots. These graves were equipped with a very similar array of grave gifts, consist uh, consisting mostly of pottery, but also, for example, an iron streagle each. In a higher layer, 
um, a deposit from the 4th century with Attic Lekatoi from the 5th century, for example, the white grounded Lekatois here, was found and the remains of a ritual pyre from the late 4th or early 3rd century BC, containing many fragments of human and animal figurines that you can see here. Uh, and a very special species of high quality fine ware in a strong red color. You can see fragments over here. With stamped egg friezes along the edges, imitating a variety of metal vessels. This pottery belongs to the various types we can now with certainty ascribe to Sikionian workshops because the detailed analysis of our finds has proven quite a lively production, pottery production already in the old city. So um, this calls for a thorough revision of what is Corinthian and what is Sikionian pottery. Other finds from um, this grave monument are two cursed tablets, which um, just have been read and translated. Very interesting um, from the uh, one from the uh, second quarter and one from the last quarter of the fourth century. So they are earlier than the graves found here and they don't belong to these graves. They must have been thrown into older graves and then they came up when the new graves uh, and the monument were dug. Our results on field seven are of very high importance also for the topography of Old Sikion as they show that there was a residential zone lying beyond a necropolis. So here, there is the necropolis and here we have another residential zone. And if you now look at this in the whole picture where field seven is here, the core is here, the necropolis is here and the residential zone is there. So. This, shows, this confirms the slightly loose settlement pattern of the city containing several nodes or at least extensions of the city beyond still functioning, functioning necropolis. As the last field, I want to present field six in the very southwest of our research area around the chapel of Ayavavara. So here. Here we started with investigating a big heap of blocks um, containing ancient spolia which was created from the building material of the Byzantine uh, church of Ayavavara when it was torn down and a new concrete church was built at the same place in the 1970s. We found ancient photographs of the old uh, Byzantine church in the archive of the Greek architect Michalis Doris here in Athens, who also investigated the church before its uh, destruction and dated it to the 14th century. The heap was almost stripped to the ground and the blocks were documented and arranged in a large lapidarium. The architectural members in this pile belong to various ancient buildings and we were hoping to find one of them at least in the area of the church. Georada prospection south of the church showed three parallel zones of higher reflection altitude. That's these three anomalies here. Wouldn't these make a very good pronouns and a seller of a temple? Yeah, alas, they were Byzantine, these walls, or Frankish, better to say. They belong to a room with a substantial floor used as a cistern and most probably representing an earlier south wing of the old church. After falling out of use, the cistern was used for burials. Summarizing our excavation results, we have found the core of the ancient settlement with archaic structures and classical domestic buildings in this area here, but also domestic uh, buildings and workshops in other areas of the activity zone. So this was, the settlement was not restricted to this area, but also here in these areas we found um, workshop and um, domestic buildings. Late geometric or archaic graves are as could be expected, closer to the center, while classical and early Hellenistic graves, graves are also uh, spread over larger parts of the uh, plain. We have one classical building, including a grave cult here, maybe an ancestor's cult and dining activity, and one monumental classical building um, here in this area, without knowing its function. Forget about Lysippos' workshop, that was a joke. And we have found several structures from Byzantine or later periods. Looking at the topographical settlement history of Sikion and the phases we are aware of, it started on the southwestern spur of the plateau from the Neolithic to the Mycenaean period and must have moved down into the southwestern plain right below, maybe at some point in the Dark Ages, we don't know exactly. 
there the settlement grew in the archaic and classical uh, times until Demetrius Polyarchetus destroyed the city, 303 BC, and moved it to the plateau again. There it stayed through the Hellenistic, Roman, and uh, Byzantine periods, as there are no traces of uh, proper Byzantine settlement in the plain. <coughs> At some point, however, villages must have formed also in the plain, and today the main settlement, the city of Kyato, lies again in the plain, directly at the coast. So there's quite some back and forth uh, over the course of the millennia where people either prefer to live on the plateau or in the plain. You might now prefer to uh, continue your life, at least for this evening at the Danish Institute and the well-deserved reception. That's why I will relieve you now and thank you very much for your attention. And with the Sikionian team from the last uh, 2019 excavation campa campaign, I say thank you also to everyone who enabled this project and the Ministry of Culture and Sports uh, overall. And my co-director of the project, Konstantinos uh, Kisos, who is now Afro of Arcadia, the Afro of Antiquities in Corinth, particularly the Afro Panayota Kasimi, all members of uh, the Institute's collaboration partners of the projects in Greece, Denmark, Germany, Cyprus, beyond, the Carlsberg Foundation and Josta Imbom Foundation, the Danish Institute and the National Museum of Denmark. And I thank you again for your attention. Thank you very much, Silke, for a thorough and very enlightening um, presentation of the results of your project in finding or about finding old secret. I'm about to close this part of the evening, uh, this part of the evening, which is um, the annual meeting of the Danish Institute, the um, evening at the OV part in the Acropolis Museum. And soon we are going to leave this building, but I have one piece of information uh, which you should bring along with you when we go to the Danish Institute. Namely, when we go there and when we come there very soon after our arrival in the uh, yard, which is uh, in the back part of the building, we will have a short session where um, Christine Put Andersen from the New Carlsberg Foundation will say uh, a few words about the work by Veo Fries uh, Jespersen. Uh, and then Veo will also say a few words about her um, uh, work. Uh, installation. So when you get to the Institute, uh, we will soon let Christine begin and then we will have the word and then we will continue the evening doing other things also. So thank you very much uh, for your attention right now and we are on our way back to the Institute.